You've now learned about the different types of software vulnerabilities, about vulnerability management, both known and unknown, about how white and black box testing can be used for unknown vulnerability management. And we're finally approaching our station. We're finally getting to fuzzing. So fuzzing is a black box testing technique for locating unknown vulnerabilities. Uh, in its simplest form, a fuzzer is just a tool for finding bugs in software. The people that care about fuzzing are the same people that care about vulnerabilities in software. So builder organizations are excited about fuzzing because it gives them uh, an additional way to find and fix more bugs in their products before they release them and ultimately save money. For a builder organization, fuzzing makes perfect sense integrated into a software development life cycle. They just find and fix more bugs before they release the product. For a buyer organization, a fuzzer is a great tool because it allows them to validate and verify the equipment and software that they're purchasing to use in their core business. So uh, for a buyer organization, uh, verification and validation is strengthened by the use of a fuzzer to locate unknown vulnerabilities. And then finally, of course, attackers are also interested in fuzzing because it's a great way to locate unknown vulnerabilities or zero days. How does a fuzzer work? We'll look at a few little more formal definitions, but in its simplest form, a fuzzer delivers intentionally malformed inputs to software to see if a failure can be triggered. So a good fuzzer does quite a few things for you. A good fuzzer, first of all, figures out what the malformed inputs should be. It generates test cases, malformed inputs, for you. And then it automatically delivers them to your target. And while it's delivering them, it monitors the target to see if some kind of failures occurred. And it also keeps really careful results, records of what it's done, so that if it does trigger a failure in your target, it's repeatable. And when it's repeatable, it's easy to fix. The whole point is you're trying to find problems in software before somebody else does. And this is both from a security standpoint and from a robustness standpoint. So the first definition of fuzzing is pretty concise and accurate. Fuzzing is the process of sending intentionally invalid data to a product in the hopes of triggering an error condition or fault. These error conditions can lead to exploitable vulnerabilities. So that's pretty good, pretty straightforward. There's also a definition from uh, ANSI IEEE uh, describing robustness testing. It says it's the degree to which a system or component can function correctly in the presence of invalid inputs or stressful environmental conditions. And then finally, uh, this one's from RFC 1122, uh, which I don't think it's one of the better known RFCs, but it's actually quite good. And I'm going to just read you a sentence from that. Software should be written to deal with every conceivable error, no matter how unlikely. Sooner or later, a packet will come in with that particular combination of errors and attributes. And unless the software is prepared, chaos can ensue. Good text in there. I encourage you to go take a look. So let's look at a, a kind of a simple analogy for how fuzzing works. And the analogy is, if I want to get into this swanky nightclub, there's this big bouncer guy standing outside. And he's the gatekeeper for the nightclub. And there's a protocol, there's a, a standard way that you communicate with this guy. And the standard is, uh, you walk up to him, you send him a message with your name in it. And then that's your request. And he checks his list. And if you're on the list, he sends back a response, yes, you can go in. And if you're not on the list, he sends back a no response. So it's a simple request and response protocol. So if you're going to fuzz test this guy, you do something invalid. You do something that doesn't follow the rules of the protocol. So you point off to the side. You say, look, a penguin. And if he goes and looks, or he faints because he's so surprised, or fails in some other way, and you gain access to the club, you've discovered a vulnerability. So fuzzing works basically like this. Here's a, a little more serious example in the HTTP network protocol. And I just want to mention we're, we're looking at a network protocol here. And protocol fuzzing is, is important. But there are actually several fuzzing disciplines uh, where network protocol fuzzing is one. 
There's also uh, content or file format fuzzing, and there's also API fuzzing. So there, there are different fuzzing disciplines, and even though we're looking at network protocols to begin with, um, don't be confined to that model because there's a much wider world of fuzzing than just that. So here uh, you can sort of see how a fuzzer creates a test case. Um, so first we're gonna look at just a normal HTTP request message, a valid request message, and then we'll look at one fuzzed version of that. And we didn't do anything really crazy here. All we did was we took that slash field in the first line of the valid message and replaced it with a bunch of A's. So that's one fuzz test case. And you can imagine creating thousands more test cases where we try all sorts of funky values for this one field, and then thousands more test cases after that where we're trying all these funky values for each one of the fields in the message. And that's basically how a fuzzer creates test cases. We'll look at this in more detail later, what the specific techniques are, but just to give you an idea of what goes on, that's what happens. So in terms of actually running the tests, I'm gonna go through four different scenarios for you. Uh, and the first one is what we call a valid case. What we're doing here is uh, not doing any fuzzing. We're just trying to make sure that our fuzzer tool is hooked up to our target correctly and that everything's configured right. So here, the fuzzer sends a valid message to the target and looks for a valid response. And again, we're just basically verifying connectivity, making sure things are hooked up right. If that works okay, we move on and start sending our actual invalid inputs, our test cases. So here's a typical test case. It's a, a malformed message going to the target. And uh, in this case, the target's able to handle it okay. It doesn't fail in any way. It sends us back a relatively normal response. And so this is probably what the bulk of your testing looks like, where uh, the fuzzer sends a test case and gets back some sort of reasonable response from the target. And the target's still healthy, and the testing just chugs along like that. Here's a test case that causes maybe some unexpected behavior on the target. So we've sent, again, one of our malformed inputs, one of our test cases to the target, and we got back a response that we didn't quite expect. Is this an error? Is it not? Um, it's something that you have to decide when you're doing fuzzing, uh, exactly what you consider to be an error, and we will go into this in more detail. But this is just an example of how we might get back an unexpected response from our target. And then this final scenario here is uh, that we have caused a failure in the target. Uh, and so, again, we sent one of our test cases to the target, and maybe we crashed a process or caused some other type of failure on the target. So these are the basic uh, scenarios of what happens during fuzz testing. Just some observations about fuzzing. Um, the first one, and I think I mentioned this before, is that all software has bugs. No matter how hard you try, you will never be able to find all of them. So the best you can do is um, get the best possible tools you can and uh, do as much testing as you possibly can in order to find the maximum number of bugs and get them fixed. Um, but uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit. Uh, there are different ways of doing fuzzing and some of them are more effective than others. So the effort that you spend and the time that you spend uh, doesn't always equal success. You have to make sure that you're spending your time and your resources as efficiently as you can. An interesting thing about fuzzers is that different fuzzers find different problems because they work different ways. And so ideally, you're going to run as many fuzzers as you possibly can. And then finally, uh, just, uh, just to emphasize that the point is really not finding the bugs, but fixing them. And so uh, your fuzzer should support a really nice remediation workflow to make it pretty smooth and easy uh, to go from finding the bugs to getting them fixed by the development team. I'd like to explore this idea of failure a little bit. Uh, one of the tricky things about fuzz testing is that you're sending these invalid inputs to software and you're trying to find out if some kind of failure has occurred. And the thing that's tricky is that there are so many different ways that a piece of software can fail. 
So I want to look at some of the failure modes or, or symptoms and what some of the code level causes of those could be, and also about how to uh, observe and, and prioritize some of the failures that you're seeing. So the, the actual failure modes uh, range from flashy to rather boring. Uh, so sometimes you're just seeing uh, some output in a log file or uh, some message on a console. Um, but the actual code level mechanisms that cause these failures are things uh, you are probably familiar with. So uh, buffer overflows, memory leaks, um, missing input validation, race conditions, stack corruption, heap overflows, underflows, all of these code level mechanisms uh, are essentially arising from bugs in the software and can lead to a certain kind of failure mode. So the, the results of these things uh, could be uh, information leaks in the form of uninitialized memory being dumped out to some log file, or uh, process crashes from segmentation faults, or maybe log file output, uh, sometimes busy loops. Sometimes a process will go into a busy loop because of a, an invalid input, uh, resource depletion, and corrupted data. And the thing, one of the things that's tricky about fuzz testing is that uh, there's really no set relationship between the code level mechanism that's being triggered here and the failure mode that you're observing. Uh, so it's just good to keep in mind that whatever kind of failure mode you're observing, it, you really can't draw any conclusions about uh, how serious that bug is or, or whether it's exploitable or not, uh, because there's just an arbitrary relationship there. One of the things people often uh, are alarmed about when they first start fuzz testing is they say, well, I, I ran 122,000 test cases and I got 2,000 failures. I've got 2,000 bugs I have to fix. But it's important to keep in mind that there's a, a one-to-many relationship usually between the uh, actual vulnerability in the software and the number of test case failures you see in your fuzz testing. And the reason is simple. Uh, it just means that uh, the fuzzer creates a whole bunch of test cases that fuzz a particular field in a message. And uh, so you could be triggering the same vulnerability in the software multiple times with different test cases. So it's just important to understand that relationship. And then finally, uh, a lot of times uh, beginning fuzzers ask how to prioritize the vulnerabilities that they've located. So if they locate 20 vulnerabilities in a piece of software. They want to prioritize them so that they fix the most dangerous ones first. And uh, there are a couple of things to keep in mind here. Um, basically, uh, the credo is fix everything. Uh, so uh, there's this idea of exploitability. Is a vulnerability exploitable or not? And uh, we say, and uh, this is backed up by Apple's uh, secure development document that, uh, for iOS, that the amount of effort it takes you to determine if a vulnerability is exploitable or not is just so much more than the amount of effort it takes to just go and fix the vulnerability that you might as well just go and fix it. Even if you did that determination of exploitability or not exploitable, uh, that's sort of a temporary thing. I mean, if you decide it's not exploitable today, who's to say that in a couple of weeks or a month or a year, somebody wouldn't figure out a way to exploit that type of vulnerability? So again, uh, it's safest just to fix all of the vulnerabilities that you locate. Fuzzing is a relative newcomer in the world of software testing and verification, but already it's found in all mature software development life cycles. And there's a simple reason for this. Fuzzing is just really good at finding unknown vulnerabilities. And if you're a buyer, assessing the risk of a piece of software or a piece of equipment. On the builder side, uh, Microsoft has included fuzzing as part of its secure development lifecycle so that more bugs can be found before a product's released. Cisco also has a secure development lifecycle, which they use for all of their products. Apple has a secure coding guide, a really excellent document for iOS and OS X in which they uh, recommend fuzzing as a way of locating bugs. 
And then other industry giants such as Adobe, Google, and IBM are also strong supporters of fuzzing. On the buyer side, more and more buyer organizations are using fuzzing as a way uh, to protect their business. So their business runs on equipment and software that they buy from other people. And they can use fuzzing uh, both during procurement as a way of assessing risk in those things that they're buying, uh, as well as uh, afterward to find and work with their vendors to get vulnerabilities fixed. An excellent example of a buyer organization is Verizon. Verizon uh, has a set of lab entry criteria which say that any organization that wishes to sell a piece of equipment to Verizon to be included into their network has to do fuzz testing with Codenomicon Defensix before Verizon will even accept that equipment into the lab. Verizon does this because their business is their network and they provide a service with that network to their customers and fuzzing allows them to ensure that they're providing the best and safest possible experience for their customers. And in addition to builders and buyers, we're also seeing meta-organizations uh, such as industry consortia and regulatory agencies that are adopting fuzzing and recommending it as part of software development. So uh, you've seen that the IETF in uh, RFC 1122 has recommended that software needs to respond to every conceivable kind of input and condition and fuzzing is a great way to test software to make sure it's ready to meet that criteria. The IEEE ANSI definition of robustness testing, again, really tees things up for fuzzing as a way of ensuring that software is robust and secure. And then NIST has a series of papers, the SP800 series, in which they discuss fuzz testing as a way to harden software and equipment. Defensix itself has been certified by ISA Secure as an approved test equipment uh, for doing ISA Secure testing. And then finally, in the United States, the FDA has done two things. Uh, first of all, they now recommend to medical device manufacturers that fuzzing be used in product development, again, as a way of finding and fixing more bugs before release. And second, the FDA has set up a cybersecurity lab in which they're uh, using Codenomicon Defensix specifically in order to test medical devices. Thank you for watching these videos. We hope you've enjoyed them. If you want to learn more about fuzz testing, visit our website at www.codenomicon.com.